My name is Apiv Kader, and I'm the CEO of Redist, a technology company focused on innovative public financing for real estate projects. This is the conversation, data and real estate are not oil and water. Uh, I'll moderate this hour-long discussion where we will learn about how our wonderful guests evaluate startup ideas, uh, several of their current investments, and opportunities that they see for all of you to start uh, the next great company that uses data in the built environment. So today, our guests are Michael Spies of Navitas Capital and Momo B of New York Ventures. So thank you, Michael and Momo, for joining us. Michael is a venture partner at Navitas Capital, a prop tech venture capital firm here in New York City. He also invests in and advises startups on his own through Fuse Strategies. He previously worked at global real estate development and investment firm Tishman Spire for 30 years and during that time created and headed the Global Innovation Program. He began his career at the New York Public Development Corporation, which is the forerunner entity to the New York City EDC. And he is a trustee of the Urban Land Institute and is a graduate of the Harvard Kennedy School and of Princeton. And since I'm a Princeton townie, that's where my parents live, I'll say uh, go Tigers. Uh, so Momo B is an early stage investor at New York Ventures, and that is New York State's venture capital fund. Prior to joining New York Ventures, uh, she worked at JP Morgan and has over 10 years of experience as a revenue growth specialist with C-level clients, VCs, and founders of startups in a wide range of industries and sizes. Uh, Momo focuses her investments in digital healthcare, climate tech, and other AI and data related startups. She's on the advisory council for entrepreneurship at Cornell and is a graduate of the Cornell Graduate School of Management and George Washington University. So let's dive right in. So real estate, I think, is the most fascinating industry in New York City because, frankly, buildings touch every part of our lives. It has also been an industry that is really resistant to change uh, because of things like hyper-specialization and labor norms. So, Michael, you had the opportunity to work in the public sector with the New York City PDC and in the private sector on projects all around the globe with Tishman Spire. What are your takeaways on how our industry handles innovation? Well, in some ways, um, the challenge for the industry has just been that it's very complicated. It's very fragmented, right? To actually organize the creation of a building has, by its nature, been really complex, right? You, you, as you said, it's highly specialized and, and, and specialists are then engaged and it tends to be, um, you know, the organization of that and, and coordinating that has always proven to be very complex. And certainly before there was any technology to speak of, and I can speak to that, it really, it's always been a very, it, it's been a very um, people-driven enterprise, right? So, it, you know, pe and therefore it's been relationship-driven, it's been driven by specialized skills, and the organization of all that was inherently inefficient, right? Which creates all sorts of opportunity now as you start to think about it, and what, what has been happening, we'll speak to that, are various ways of improving that, um, that whole undertaking, right? And um, that can have to do with uh, how certain processes, which have been relying on a variety of individuals mm -hmm. to be coordinated, um, gave way to, okay, now there's data that can be organized uh, through the, th and, and through the use of software process can be um, made more smooth. And now it's gotten to the point where actually it can be automated, right? Um, that's happening fairly systematically. And while it, it, it certainly can seem painfully slow, mm -hmm. um, I actually see the change happening rather quickly now. It hasn't yet been joined up. It's still incredibly fragmented. That's been the main struggle so far in terms of adoption of a variety of prop tech solutions, because the solutions have tended to be quite specific to specific problems. And many of the customers, you know, the, the, the owners and developers of real estate are really waiting on more holistic solutions that don't require them to speak to 30 different solution you know, providers of, of different solutions. So um, long way of saying, I think, I, I think it has been, you know, one could say it's been slow, but I don't think it's been surprisingly so when you consider how, how uh, real estate has traditionally been 
organized. That's actually a really good point because if you think of things in the time scale of uh, the life cycle of a building, typically 30 to 40 years uh, for a commercial building, if you're talking about the, um, the, the length of time that we, for example, have been pouring concrete or laying brick, it's pretty much the same way as the Romans and the Egyptians did. Uh, so I think the idea of time scale for industry is really long. So if it's taken us 10 years to make some of these changes, maybe in the grand scheme of things, it isn't actually that slow. I'm really curious, you mentioned that uh, you, uh, in the course of your 30 years with Tishman Spire, you uh, were able to obviously transact business and, and be successful before there was things like Zillow and Cherry and other companies that we're talking about today. Give us a window of what what doing business in commercial real estate was like in that era pre all of that data oriented technology. Well, it, it, it uh, <clears throat> you know, it, it's pretty wild when you think about the amount of time required to just communicate that, you know, yeah. and, and link up the different uh, segments uh, of, you know, the different communication channels. Right. And um, so, you, you know, the, the answer really was you got armies of people in a room and you tried to organize things that way, but that wasn't mm-hmm. always possible. Um, but step by step, it's given way to clearly, you know, digitization in various forms, which allows things to happen much more quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that's probably, oh, sorry, go ahead, Michael. No, no, I, I just think it, it's, it's very hard to, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's crazy when you think about what is at hand today. And in some ways you look back and saying, how could any building get built? Um, without this stuff, but yeah, it <laughs> happened. It happened. In fact, things, I mean, crazily enough, uh, buildings, uh, think about how quickly the Empire State Building got built and, and, sure. and yeah, things can get done. It just requires armies of people and, and, and a lot of, um, a lot of communication. I think that's probably one thing that will, uh, never change about our industry is how relationship, uh, oriented and relationship based it is. Um, so, Momo, you've had the opportunity to work in financial services and then transitioned into venture capital. Help us understand what exactly venture capital is and how it is different, say, from uh, from that versus private equity or, say, like public equities. Yeah. So um, when I was in financial services, I actually focused in asset management. So I kind of worked with all the different assets out there, both in private and in public. Um, and I think eventually venture capital just became one of the areas that I was particularly interested in because this is the investment and asset class where you do take the most risk. But at the end of the day, Mm -hmm. you have the opportunity to work with what is the frontier of revolutionizing every industry you can think of. Like this is the area where we get to build and develop and fund things that are really changing people's qualities of lives, changing industries, um, hopefully for the better. At least that's the goal. Um, So when I was looking at the different asset classes out there, I think private equity It's super interesting in a way that both venture capital and private equity are in the private market. So Mm -hmm. the asset is not available for the public to trade freely. But at the same time, private equity a lot of times requires a lot more proof, right? So they need the business model to work out. They need the company to have certain revenue and traction for them to feel comfortable to get in. And then they add value by either either consolidating or turning around a business or one way or another to be able to be make the business more profitable than before to make an investment. Where venture capital, we're really looking at a lot of ideas that have not been proven out. We're looking at a lot of trial and error. And we're you know, going in with the mindset that we are going to make a lot of mistakes and we welcome mm-hmm. them because that's how you make change. So it's a totally different mindset, but it's also a different return profile. It's a different volume when you look at the amount of the deals we look at. Um, I think the public market is when things usually are already proven out. Like the business model is at a point where this company has the confidence to go into the to the public market, where majority of the investors are probably still institutional investors, but they're also ready for everybody out there to evaluate them, including individual investors, including people who you know, don't have the same background, but want to understand and hold investments in their company. So it's a totally different communication strategy as well, in terms of like how to set expectation 
at that time, a lot of things are already very predictable. And mm -hmm. with a lot of the fintech te technologies out there, such as Stash, um, the public market has become a lot more um, accessible for the general public. And you know, we believe that that is a good thing to be able to bring that accessibility into the market. And it's almost like I love the way you're putting it from venture capital to private equity to public market in a way it's almost like a life cycle of a company. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's the the journey to um, maturity for a startup, a revolution idea to really eventually build up not just the business and you know all the blood and tears and sweat to eventually get it ready to mature into a company that's ready for the public market. That's a great point. So I think it, it feels like the summary of that idea is the risk and reward profile changes over the timeline of, of a business. And that's been the progression of the market that you go into in order to, to raise money. Um, so Michael, your firm, Navitas Capital, has a mandate focused on technology to drive innovation in the real estate industry. And then Momo, your firm, New York Ventures, has a wide mandate uh, focused on job creation, economic development, and climate change response in New York State. Um, help our listeners understand the strengths of both a very specific um, strategy, like in the case of uh, yours, Michael's, and uh, in a broad mandate in the case of uh, yours, Momo. Let's start with Momo for this question. Sure. So um, we are a public evergreen fund which means when our fund was set up, we have a certain amount that was allocated to this fund. And um, as an evergreen fund, we don't ever go out to fundraise. What we try to mm -hmm. do is to make sure that we generate um, enough return for the fund to continue, for us to be able to continue to invest in the investment thesis that we believe in. And that does give us the flexibility to also change from time to time. Overall, we want to be able to build a very robust, vibrant, diverse ecosystem within New York State. Um, so that helps us also, you know, prioritize some of the things that's important from a policymaking standpoint. So, you know, for example, whether if it's climate or if it's um, digital healthcare, some of our top priorities is basically the government makes policies. We have goals and then we make policies for these goals. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, most of the time we don't go out to execute. So we are actively looking for technologies and innovations that help us to be able to execute or help the industry is out there and the companies out there, the private sector to execute, to be able to achieve a lot of our policy goals. So even though it is a wider mandate that a lot of times I do feel like I'm working as a generalist, but at mm -hmm. the end of the day, I think to understand that's our overall investment thesis really helps us narrow down to how we should spend our time and energy. And what's your perspective on that, Michael? Yeah, I think clearly um, while you, you can draw this distinction, private, public, the, you know, Navitas is really looking to invest in, in, in big solutions, right? Mm -hmm. And the nature of the problem oftentimes involves public interests as well as private interests, right? And I think real estate is inherently both, right? I mean, real estate is, sure. is, 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 the, is the physical realm, right? And oftentimes that involves, I mean, these days, you, I think we're all thinking a lot about the public realm, right? Uh, the public realm's being reshaped um, and there's all kinds of opportunity in that. Um, but Navitas, is, yes, it's, it's, a, it's a prop tech VC also focusing on, on, on construction. Um, and, and along the way, a number of investments have been made. And the, and the, the phase of investment is that, you know, at the, at the formative stages of, of, a, of, a, of an enterprise, even pre-revenue, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but typically investing at the point where revenue is, has formed and there is a product that a customer is willing to pay for, right? And then that young enterprise um, requires capital and strategic guidance to grow, right? So um, typically, in terms of you know the defined stages of investing, Navitas focused you know from seed through Series B, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the um, but the nature of the, the problems, while they are real estate specific, um, they also oftentimes have real environmental impacts as well, right? I mean, real estate does consume a lot of resource, right? But, and, and step by step, the digitization of process is having benefit environmentally, even in ways that might not be, f you know, f uh, one, one of the groups we invested in early on was a group called Plan Grid. Um, mm -hmm. 
in the old days, before technology, when you were designing and building and you were making changes along the way, there, the process of altering design as you're building required big sheets of plans to be printed every day and again, shipped and again, and again. from the architects to, to the site. And actually, for big projects, that runs to hundreds of thousands of dollars in printing costs, which, which means a lot of paper, right? Yes. A lot of paper was being moved around. And a team you know, figured out how to digitize that whole process and instantaneously transmit changes and plans from architect to construction site. And that, that's a, that alone w- might sound like a small idea, but it actually moved the needle in big ways environmentally as well. And, and that continues now as, as, as different forms of data are being used to help people remotely visualize things that are happening somewhere else, right? It means they don't have to travel as much. It means, you know, all these things are, in fact, significant. So, and, and engaging the size of an idea. So, one thing a venture capitalist is looking to figure out is, okay, what's the size of the opportunity? How big could mm-hmm. this be? And, um, and it's inherently risky. And it's the nature of, you know, you're identifying ideas that you think are ideas that are sound, are differentiated, and, 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 and try to solve a big problem. Then you're assessing the nature of the sponsor of that idea, the, you know, the entrepreneur who's got the idea and their ability to put together the team and resource to make it happen, right? And, and, and then you want to understand what's the strategy to get there, you know, and how, how are they thinking about that? And is there the, the, uh, the essential mix of uh, focus on execution as well as strategic vision looking, if not three steps ahead, certainly two steps ahead, and, and, but staying focused enough to not get lost in the possibilities and, 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 and fail to execute. So that, that, those are all elements that come into play as you're looking at, at young enterprises and, and, and making investments at that stage. That's an excellent point that you brought up uh, in the beginning of your response about the, even on its surface, the idea of a firm focused on real estate technology seems like a narrow mandate, but the reality of the two biggest crises for our city or the two biggest issues for our city uh, is uh, climate change and housing affordability. And both of them clearly go right through our industry. Um, so I think that's a, a spectacular um, a point that you brought up. And then I love the framework that you that you presented in terms of how you look at uh, the startup ideas that come through in order to um, kind of pick and choose ones that you that you think are going to turn into unicorns versus say like My Little Ponies. Uh, so it, it's the three things that you mentioned were the the soundness of the value proposition, the quality of the sponsor, and then that overall strategy that combines those two pieces together to actually be able to execute. Um, so, Momo, from your perspective, uh, what is the what's the framework that you like to use when you uh, are sent deals to take a look at at New York Ventures? Yeah, so um, we kind of use the framework where we um, take a look at the market first, and then we understand the team. From the team, we go drill down to product and then the price of the deal. So, um, if I start from the beginning. One of the things we do is we actually do a pretty macro, big picture view of an industry that the, they're trying to solve the problem. Because mm-hmm. um, for a lot of early stage startup, it's really important to understand, like, for example, when you're doing something that's completely new, um, it's easy to think about there isn't really a competitor out there. But at the end of the day, there's an alternative. Like, how are mm-hmm. things currently being done? Um, who's doing all those things and how are how is what you're doing going to make a significant difference? And with that, it kind of helps us understand how big the problem is, which goes back to what Michael was talking about. Like as a venture capitalist, because our return um, profile is very different than the later stage companies, it's really important for us to work with companies that we can build a conviction that's solving a very large problem. And Mm -hmm. I think this applies to us at the public sector as well, because a lot of the policy-driven, policy tailwinds we're looking for are also incredibly large problems for our society. So that kind of helps us define the problem, the players, you know, and I think one thing we look at in addition to some of the private investors is if this change really happened, how does it impact the different stakeholders in the entire ecosystem? 
um, what does it mean for the incumbents? Like what's going to happen to their industries and changes? Like, is it overall something that's going to be great for our society? So mm-hmm. once we have a good understanding of the size of the problem and how complex it is, and we do prefer to work with teams that are working on very complex problems, because that's going to give them room and time to make mistakes, to be able to find the right solution. From there, we look at why is this team uniquely qualified to solve this problem? And then from there, we kind of understand what is the product that they're trying to build. But we also do understand, so very similar to Michael, we invest from anything from pre-seed to series B. Um, So a lot of times the products actually go through a lot of changes. So um, we do want to understand how they think about it, but it's not like the things we, we really it's not exactly where we build a conviction. It's the thought process of how to want to build a product that we build a conviction. And then the last step is really just trying to figure out whether the price of the deal makes sense. Got it. And I think what's fascinating is both uh, Michael and Momo, you brought up the like a core piece of this idea is the, the founder and the team. Um, so our industry has had some pretty spectacular flame outs and dumpster fires from WeWork to Katera uh, to home polish. And I think, frankly, a lot of that has to do with uh, their founders. Um, talking about some of the values that you look for or the personality traits that you look for in founders when, I mean, frankly, the, the, the business might literally just be an idea and some basic rubrics of what it could be. So there's a lot of room for, for analysis for you guys. So what are the things that you guys look for? Uh, Michael, why don't you uh, go first? Well, look, it's, um, if you think about the word entrepreneur, and and uh, oftentimes you just think, well, that's that's um, somebody who's an incurable optimist who can mm-hmm. who will run through a brick wall to make things happen, right? Um, and that's a bit of a cliche, right? Because um, that also can tend to, if if that ends up um, involving the wrong aspects of ego, mm-hmm. that's that's where the train wrecks happen, right? Um, so I always look for and and many. Many uh, venture investors look at the dynamics uh, within founding teams, really. And actually, a founder who actually, by their nature, um, speaks to their, whether they're co-founders or not, they've already envisioned, they know the kinds of complementary resources they're going to need around themselves to make mm-hmm. something happen. Um, I don't, you know, whether it's startup world or any, any type of enterprise, if, if too much revolves around one person, um, it can be that the vision is just so overwhelmingly exciting. And if that vision attracts other people who, who, who get it and that's, the person is a good communicator and they can get people excited, that's great. You know, yeah, there are plenty of very, very successful, huge companies that have been built around a single person's vision, right? Um, they also knew how to build teams, right? Um, and that's, that's a, a critical ingredient. You can't, you can't grow any enterprise without really building a cohesive team that has a strong culture. Those are, you know, culture is a very, very important ingredient of success. True, And I think uh, if you think about it from an old school perspective, Walt Disney is probably a perfect example of what you just described. And then I think a, a new school perspective, it would be uh, Elon Musk. And I think both of those founders had a lot of uh, issues, I think, in terms of managing their own emotions um, relative to managing a team. Um, but I think it's a it's a very fine balancing act. What are your what are the traits that you look for, Momo? Yeah, so I love this question, um, and I think one of the things that um, we look for is we actually do quite a bit of um, reference calls that we don't always just ask you know the most famous and the best investor in the room in this round. We ask to talk to people who has known this founder for many, many years. We're trying to understand more about this person's character because I think you know you gave some good examples about you know some companies that went down in flames, but you know, there are a few things that we should talk about here. The first thing is governance is very important for a startup, but usually neglected until later stage. So I do recommend whenever a board is set up, there should at least be one independent board members because when the companies grow and they're starting to scale and things are looking very exciting, the greed and the appetite in the room also increase. 
it's very, it's not just the founders. Like I, I actually hate media, I always blame the founders. A lot of times it is the investors and the venture capitalists in the room that they're, you know, seeking that round. They're seeking that multiple. They're looking for what makes their numbers look good. That always, not not 100% of the time, that's really in the company's best interest. And we need to have that independent board members in the room to provide that voice um, of governance. So the other thing I want to talk about is I would also suggest founders to do a good amount of diligence on their investors. I think for early stage companies, before they build up the traction, a lot of times they feel like they just you know want to get that money in the bank so they can start building the team and the product. But at the end of the day, this is investors you're stuck with for the next eight years. And it's important to do some diligence, reverse diligence, and see if those are the characters and the people you want to work with. Look into their history, talk to their portfolio founders. And the third thing is the importance of having diverse teams and diverse boards. Because when you have people from different backgrounds, they provide different perspectives. And those voices are so important when you're going through crossroads when the moral compass might be a little bit hard to find. You you guys might enjoy then, uh, so Lowenstein Sandler is... Uh, Redis uh, Council, and that they're wonderful if anyone in this call is looking for okay. a law firm. Uh, they describe that uh, the number of times that they have seen someone in a pre-seed round a founder be essentially Bernie Sanders. That's the, the approach that they have to the world around them. And by the time that they get to their Series A or their Series B, they've morphed into Mitt Romney uh, in terms of when they approach the world around them, uh, which I think is a I hope that's not my case, but we'll see what happens in our next round. Uh, and uh, I think now that we've set up a nice foundation in terms of understanding real estate and venture capital and, and how venture capital investors um, that are very successful, like Michael and Momo, think, um, we're going to pivot now into case studies. We can now put this into real life. So, Michael, why don't you start with uh, Cherry and what the uh, what, what's going on with that company? Well, um, Cherry is a, and, and I'm going to, in in the two cases I will speak to, I'm going to speak a little bit to where, where they came from, because because they're different types of stories. And I think that can be instructive, too, in terms of there's no, uh, there's no playbook here, no set playbook. Um, Cherry was founded by, you know, superb data science talent, right? And data is enormous, right? I mean, real estate is so full of data. It, it is, I think, to people who really love data and work with data, real estate becomes very, very exciting because it's, it's so dynamic, right? You have different types of data. And actually, you know, it's not just the stuff you find in, ter- you know, in, ter- in the data sets around socioeconomics, demographics. It's, you know, what's coming to join in is visual data, right? Um, all kinds of um, physical data, right? You talked earlier, out of about um, concrete, right? Mm-hmm. And you think concrete's always been concrete, right? Well, point. concrete, you know, there are systems being created now that in real time are altering the mix of cement into concrete, which is a big, has a big Im- environmental impact. And to the extent you can optimize that mix based on the conditions during which concrete is poured, and, and if to the extent that you can optimize the reading of the curing process of concrete in a vertical stack, if you can save a few days per floor, again, there's a financial benefit to go in alongside the environmental benefit. And, and this is all what could be termed physical data that from which we're going to learn in terms of um, not putting so much material unnecessarily into buildings. That's, mm-hmm. That has been one um, large source of the embedded carbon in structures where many structures have been over-engineered. I'm, and I'm not espousing taking risk in structures, but oftentimes in the way things have been created, there's, there's always cushion uh, to prevent, you know, unnecessary risk being taken. But sometimes it just means a lot of steel and, and, and uh, cement gets put into structures, which is not necessary. So Cherry came out, Cher- Cherry approached it, um, um, data scientist with financial services background, founder, you know, put together a team in New York. Uh, they, uh, I think they won a, a, a real estate board of New York hackathon in 2017. Mm-hmm. They worked with many of the city agencies, actually, not just, I think it very much to mutual benefit in terms of the, 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 the refinement of some of the data within the Department of Buildings and other city agencies. Those same sources became uh, part of what Cherry has really built, which is 
you know, one of the largest, most powerful, you know, data warehouses to serve the real estate and financial services sector. Um, and um, so the, the, and they, they've grown uh, very dramatically. They, they, they launched the product in 2018. Um, they've been through, they, they've, they've been through now their series B last year mm -hmm. and have um, a large team in New York serving a bunch of different clients, um, both on public oriented issues and, you know, and, and obviously, you know, lenders, insurers, other types, real estate owners on a variety of um, use cases that they can create data solutions to drive um, better outcomes for the, whether it's an investment strategy or an operating strategy on behalf of their clients. And for folks so, that are, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. And, and um, I think one of the, the things that they, one of the things that's, that's, Noteworthy, particularly as this is, you know, we are speaking about data and real estate, um, mm -hmm. given the quantum and the nature of uh, data available, but the need, the nature of most of that data is not, there's a, is a huge amount of cleanup required before the data is actually useful in terms of actually creating some of the um, insights that ultimately will drive, you know, investment process and asset management process within, within the real estate sectors. Um, and so the, uh, the ability to pull together, you know, a team of data scientists who have that specific talent to do that um, has been a key ingredient to their, to their success. And, and there's a logic to, you know, most, most players in the, even, even the largest institutional players in real estate, you know, some of the insurers, given how much money they lend into real estate as well as own real estate, um, it's just a natural, it's always been a natural asset class for insurance uh, capital, um, they're sitting on mountains of data. But you know, one of the things that's a, 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 the question is: Are they are they themselves going to have the ability to draw in uh, data sci scientists to to do do the work? Um, um, and you know, I think Cherry's very much a bet on the notion that no, that this is a you know, this is a highly specialized set of skills um, that can, that really does lend itself to a shared platform that'll just create solutions for the industry. Absolutely. And for anyone that is uh, checking them out online, a cherry is spelled with an E at the end in this case, as opposed to a Y. Uh, and I think particularly what is fascinating is whether you're a company that's focusing like cherry on traditional data sets, which often come from uh, places like county registrars, which are recording everything from mortgages to liens to purchases and acquisitions that forms the backbone of uh, oftentimes for information sets that uh, companies like cherry use or companies that are using non-traditional data sets. Uh, so for example, like mine, Redist, which focuses on um, both quantitative and qualitative information about public financing from a vast array of places. Um, both of them uh, are, are challenging and interesting from a, a data science perspective to, to be able to tackle. Um, the, the second company that you were focusing on in your case studies, uh, Michael, is Bowery Valuation. Tell us about that, given many people may be buying and selling homes right now in the stock market. Right. So, so Bowery, different, different sort of story in terms of the origins, but the, the, these were um, a, a group of founders who came out of the appraisal industry, right? So um, real estate is a huge asset class that transacts in all kinds of ways, not just the purchase and sale, but the refinance, you know, and every time there's a transaction and even for owners of real estate, oftentimes on a recurring basis, there's valuation of the asset, right? So, you know, back to the, the private equity model that, that, that Momo spoke to earlier, you know, private, equ private equity ownership of real estate, whether, you know, um, will employ or has traditionally employed valuers to give periodic independent views of the value of the assets, right? Um, each time there's been a valuation, there's, you know, it, it's been a very, you know, it, it, it's, it's actually a pretty cumbersome process, but, and it's not, and it's all backward looking in terms of basically it, traditionally people reviewed transactions that had already occurred, right? Mm -hmm. So by definition, that's stale data, right? And um, so Bowery set out to create you know, the potential for real-time valuation based on reading data and, and incorporating data much more rapidly to, and, and creating enough data to actually begin to approach true real-time valuation, right? But, but more importantly, what they've already created is very quick, seamless valuation, right? So they, they're now serving a bunch of different clients in a much more um, efficient manner to create valuations in, in real-time. 
So that, that and that was so that's an example of a big problem in terms of there's huge amounts of money spent on valuations in real estate, right? Um, and oftentimes the nature of the valuation is not impressive, right? Um, you know, through the typical real estate cycles, when you've read about banks and uh, and 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 owners of real estate losing tons of money, you know, if you look at the most recent valuations, oftentimes before the losses were recognized, yeah, they were way off the mark, right? So it's a real source of risk to have antiquated appraisal process, and and so they're, they they have a big opportunity around a big problem and um, have a lot of customers now recognizing a better way to, to, to get at appraisals. And I think what's really fascinating as more data and analytical processes have been uh, injected into a relatively stale human-driven endeavor, which is appraisal services, uh, it's become clear and clear about the systematic differences uh, in valuations, whether you are one race or another in the United States. And I think uh, being able to call that out, first identify it, and then be able to come up with hopefully tools through uh, services like Bowery to address that and let that be a vestige of our past and not something we're still uh, messing around with, uh, I think is a really important one. Uh, so Momo, uh, New York and the metropolitan New York area, New York City area is probably one of the most uh, climate risk uh, climate risked uh, part, uh, parts of the United States. Uh, so talk to us about block power and uh, what what uh, they're up to as a company. Yeah, so Block Power is a super interesting company. Um, they basically have the ability to retrofit buildings from um, the old energy system into energy efficient buildings. And um, we met this company a few years ago. This is actually one of the first investments I did at this fund. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very difficult for buildings, especially multifamily homes and um, low income c- communities to be able to um, transform their buildings into energy efficient buildings for a few reasons. The first thing is it's just incredibly difficult to do. Usually they have to find quite a few vendors to come in to do the evaluation and they will give them very different results and very mm-hmm. different quotes for the same building. If you use different vendors to come in, the contractors, they give you different quotes. And this usually it's a process that takes about two weeks or so to get that initial quote. And they can be drastically different. So Block Power is able to use the data, a public data available of the different buildings and the pricing and the strategy based on like how is this building built? Like what will be the most effective way to make it energy efficient? So they have this algorithm that they can do that evaluation within an hour instead of two weeks. And they can provide the most accurate estimate of how much it's going to cost you because they will, they're going to tell you exactly what you need to be able to do this. And if you look at New York as a whole, but also this world in general, buildings contribute 30% into a carbon dioxide into our environment. Mm-hmm. So there's no way New York State or the United States or the world will be able to achieve its climate goals without addressing the issue with buildings releasing carbon dioxide. There's just, you you can't ignore the 30% monster in the equation, right? So that's how we start to become very interested in block power. Um, Mm -hmm. We really love their power to use the data available to be able to translate that. And they have built so much since that point that they have now have the ability to actually, so when we first met them, they showed us how it will work for a building and then they have the ability to do an entire block in an instant. And now they can map an entire city. It's called block map. And you can just layer that, all the data they have available, and then you can layer that to the city map. And it's going to tell you which buildings can you know, make what difference and do what type of work. The mm-hmm. second most difficult part about doing this kind of retrofitting is there's no money available. So if you think about low-income neighborhoods, community mm-hmm. centers, um, urban areas, nobody has the budget to do this, even though they know it's better for the environment. And in 10 years, it's better for their return as well. So because Block Power now you have used the data to have to build this powerful algorithm, they can provide um, to the very large loan facilities and the, the banks to aggregate to lower their risk. They can aggregate all these buildings and tell them, we can tell you precisely how this will work. If you can give us a loan and we can do like, you know, five blocks in Brooklyn. Yep. And because of that, they're able to do a zero down financing model. And they can they have a 
um, received a loan facility from the New York Green Bank, from Goldman Sachs, and then they're working on corporate green bonds with a lot of the companies that have uh, made commitments to, uh, but don't really know how to execute, to be able to form these corporate green bonds to finance all these projects and all these retrofit. And um, when we invest in them, it was a very early stage idea. The founders are brilliant and resilient people. They're just one of those, like, if you meet them, you're so like, taken away by their passion. And they have been working on this for a very long time. So um, they have recently, um, this was in the news uh, Q4 last year, that they have signed a contract to retrofit the entire city of Ithaca. Um, they're in negotiations with a few more cities. Um, some on the East Coast, some in California. And then um, it just came out today in the news that they were ranked number four by Fast Company as the world's most innovative companies. Um, and Tesla ranked seven. So I was really <laughs> proud. <laughs> I think ranked number four. But, even, um, even Tesla's overrated at seven, I think. <laughs> <laughs> For the reason you described, 30%. There's a reason right there. Right, right. Yeah, and so I, it's, you know, it's, it's one of those companies that, we, we just don't think we can achieve our climate goals without them. And yeah. it's really the data out there that has given them the ability to, to use and analyze and put this all together. And what's fascinating is that corollary, corollary of what you described uh, in terms of risk and a lack of financing is something that um, we, we see as a, a strong issue as well with Redis. So, for example, as we are successful in um, getting our clients uh, historic tax credits, new market tax credits, and other uh, such public financing programs that we find is for particular sets of deals. Um, so ones where uh, clients need uh, $5 million or less of tax credit initiated financing. Oftentimes there aren't people out there that are willing to uh, invest in such small deals. Um, so the solution effectively is a fund that allows you to uh, mitigate risk off across a large number of deals and be able to service projects that otherwise would not have gotten financed. Um, so I think that 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 structure that, that you described is an absolutely wonderful one. Um, so now listening to these three really great companies, uh, Cherry, Barry Valuation, and our final company, uh, Block Power, uh, there's a couple of issues that I want to, or themes that I want to bring up before we open it up to uh, questions that our audience might have. So Momo, the first thing I wanted to uh, talk about was uh, the vast amount of data that all three of these companies have available to them. And what are your thoughts or your impressions of how a company can identify what data is valuable to them to focus on versus uh, this getting lost in this ocean of information that, that Michael had described our industry produces every single day in terms of data? Yeah, I would say um, often both the founders and um whoever is working on like as their chief data um, scientist or the people we talk to, to get a better understand of A, where they're getting the data from, because mm -hmm. the quality is so important. Because if you don't have good quality to go into your algorithm, whatever you produce is not useful. Um, garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so we ask them, where are they getting it from and the quality of it? We also do checks in terms of whether this data um, is biased or not. So we do that quite a bit in healthcare um, because there's a lot of lack of healthcare equity out there. So we actually specifically ask them to give us the breakdown in terms of the different racial background and income background of the data they're collecting. Um, and then the third part is, you know, we want to understand the leadership strategy in terms of how are they building, how are they filtering out the noise when they are looking at very large data sets, like what do they include and what do they choose to filter out? So those are some of the top things we look at when we first meet a company that's working with a lot of data. And then, uh, Michael, one uh, tension that exists for companies in our industry is this idea between being a self-serve, SaaS, pure technology company, and then the one of being a technology-enabled consulting firm. Um, walk us through your perspective on this, having been in our industry for 30 years. Yeah, the, um, well, j just to explain briefly, the, the, the pot of gold in, in, uh, in, in, in venture is, is to uh, invest in a software which grows to dominate its space. And, and, and where the space is big, because 
software to sell software doesn't require, I mean, if, if it's really something that works and can be um, activated quickly and seamlessly, you know, you, you can, that, that's where you see revenues explode and companies become, you know, very, very, very large. And, yeah, um, and which leads to, you know, the famous Mark Andreessen quote, you know, software will eat the world, right? And, uh, but there's, there's also potential and there are many ideas that really are uh, driven by data that have cre been created already in real estate that actually found that actually, so for example, one of the big areas, and we won't have time to talk about it, but, um, and in New York City, probably, you know, led the way in terms of the ability to use data that the city put out there for everybody to use to do early massing studies, zoning studies of, of, a, of a specific lot on a specific block. And, you know, there are some great companies that have been created using that data to allow you to very rapidly do a quick back of the envelope sketch to figure out what could be built on a specific site. And again, that, that can be done instantaneously, and it's a hugely valuable tool. And I, um, and I, and I've, I've engaged with several groups that were, you know, that have been basically developing platforms to, to do that in different cities around the world. And the, the problem that leads to is they're thinking that they will be able to offer that as a service, that's, that there will be enough people out there to pay for that on a recurring basis. But in reality, um, the people who will pay for it will, will be really thinking of it on a, on, a, on a project by project basis. So it ends up being more of a services stream of revenue as opposed to a true software as a service type of revenue. Because the number of groups that would actually pay for that as a service, you know, maybe the very, very large professional services groups or the very, very large architectural groups, very, very large developers might might pay for that. But actually, just in the way that these things happen, that ended up being a tough sell, right? So that there, that line can be quite fine at times, but but it is, it's a very, very important distinction. Because really, from a venture investing perspective, what, what, what we want to see is, is actually potential to create a recurring stream of subscription revenue. That's really fascinating because for us at Redist, we uh, heard this in our customer discovery and our, pilot, um, our pilots often, and it really didn't settle in for us till probably a year and a half into our company is this expression we heard so many times, which was, yeah, 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 this is really cool stuff, but can you just like do everything for us? Uh, and I think that's essentially the core of this idea of a technology-enabled consulting firm. Um, so uh, I'm going to pause here, and we're going to open up to questions. We have one uh, right now, which is focusing on Local Law 97. So uh, why don't we start with uh, Momo and give your perspective. So do you feel that Local Law 97, uh, which is focused on the energy efficiency performance of buildings and establishing a rating system and then fines related to that, um, for non-compliance uh, is going to be really transformative for uh, buildings and uh, decarbonization for our city. So, um, you know, obviously as, as the venture arm, we were not uh, involved in creating the policy. Mm -hmm. um, so we only learn about it after the fact. It's just like the rest of the world. Um, but I would say it is the beginning of really paying attention to our buildings and the kind of emission they're putting out to the world, which hasn't mm -hmm. really been transparent before, or I don't think it has been studied and labeled to the scale we're doing it right now. And I think, you know, not to speak for the policymakers, but I think it's because we're starting to realize it's impossible to achieve our climate goals without it. So I do think the retro retrofitting buildings is a very important and large and fastly growing sector. Um, and, and I think with having these ratings is going to help it accelerate. But at the end of the day, you know, this country and this city, there, there are a lot of old cities and old buildings out there. We don't have the ability to just completely tear it down and rebuild it into like the modern technology. So it's really the retrofitting part that's going to help us achieve our climate goals. And bringing and data and transparency and numbers and rating into it, it's the beginning of really being able to deploy that. It's a great point because the life cycle of buildings makes it such that new construction isn't going to solve all of our problems. Michael, your thoughts? Yeah, look, I think... Um, I, what I find unfortunate is that, that that we would think that this is actually the solution. It is a it is a it is a program which yeah. will have impact and is positive, but it's not anywhere. It won't have anywhere near the impact which 
a more a more proactive approach from you know, from the public side would be. I mean, there are there there's a there's a need for cities across the board to actually relook at their zoning and their building codes. Mm -hmm. If they were to bring those bring the zoning and codes up to date and allow for reuse of buildings truly in a in a in the way that they should be allowed um, many of the rules have been were established at a time for very different reasons and actually given the the threat of of, of climate change why wouldn't that be the overwhelming imperative to now re look at everything and update everything right the other thing is that the, policies around right. that and look in terms of energy um uh, generation. L London, for a time, you know, came out with a rule that any new building would have to create 20% of its own energy from uh, renewable sources, which was a nice headline, but it actually was very, w was not effective. And it just, in many ways, diverted attention from what's really required, which is district level and more, yeah. you know, broader solutions in terms of power generation. Um, and I think that, you know, a more informed discussion around policies that are really aimed at having the ultimate impact that's going to be required. Um, I find it, I find it discouraging that there's not more discussion around the, the, the bigger, higher level policy initiatives that have to happen. Um, individual retrofits of buildings can and should happen all over the place, but that's not going to be enough. I think that leaves a lot of opportunity for our listeners and the participants in Open Data Week to come up with the the next great, great business idea for our industry using data. So thank you so much for joining us today at Open Data Week uh, and uh, Michael and Momo for taking the time out of your day to, to be here with us. Um, so guests, you can uh, connect with Michael, Momo and I on LinkedIn and to hear more conversations on the built environment, uh, check out the American Building Podcast uh, where I uncover the behind the scenes stories of how iconic buildings in our country were designed and built. So it's a podcast that Rita sponsors with the world famous design firm, Michael Graves, Architecture and Design. You can check us out at AmericanBuildingPodcast.com. So my name is Afif Kader from Redist and enjoy the rest of Open Data Week.